there's some really cool new evidence surrounding creatine and fat loss, believe it or not, because we used to think maybe creatine actually makes you gain weight, but <laughs> looks like it might have some other effects. I've got Dr. Darren Kandow, who's one of the world's leading researchers in the world of creatine. Tell us about this study. Yeah, so it's an interesting thought. A lot of people were speculating that creatine and, and exercise may lead to an increase in, in fat mass. And, and when you look at the body, if it increases muscle, I was really hesitant or speculating that it, it probably doesn't increase fat mass, which have, would have huge negative implications for obesity and, and population health. And so we did a meta-analysis where we took all the existing studies and we sort of combined it into statistical software to give it more statistical power or more validity to the conclusions we make. And the first one we wanted to do was from a healthy aging perspective where older adults are more prone to obesity, uh, sarcopenia, and, and uh, cardiovascular disease. And in adults 50 and above, uh, when they combine creatine and resistance training, they actually had a reduction statistically significant in body fat percentage and a non-significant reduction in absolute amount of body fat. And what that really means is if the average male or female over 50 years of age had 20% body fat, when they went on resistance training and creatine intervention, they might have reduced it to around 18 to 19%. Um, and they also lost a small amount of body fat as well. And just the other day, we put up a preprint, the paper's in review. Now we wanted to look at the other side of the population, adults 18 to 49 years of age, which is probably the population that will consider creatine the most. Primarily, it's in ma uh, young males, but a lot of young females, um, which I'm very happy about, are, are starting to consider creatine as an adjunct. And although it's in review, I can probably disclose what we found. Again, it's not uh, uh, published yet, but we found almost identical results. There was a small, significant reduction in body fat percentage and a very small reduction in absolute body fat. So overall, when you look at both populations, uh, creatine does not increase body fat when combined with resistance training. And if anything, it can have a very small reduction in body fat percentage. That could have huge implications for obesity or individuals later on in life, because I think if you decrease body fat, younger age, or at any time in your life, that has huge metabolic benefits. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest scare tactics. A lot of people said, I don't want to take creatine because I heard it increases body fat. Uh, in our two papers, we don't see that effect. I want to mention, I popped a 30% off discount link down below for Thrive Market. Now, Thrive Market is an online grocery store, but it's not like a regular grocery store. It's set up by different diet categories. Okay, so you've got keto, you've got vegan, you've got paleo, you've got different diet categories. So it allows you to get the best quality foods, Okay, no preservatives, no garbage. You can stock up your whole house, not just your pantry. They have sustainable meat and seafood options, so you can stock up your fridge. They're working on really cool options as well. So you're looking at just everything you can get in a store, essentially, that's gonna be in frozen or in the regular section, delivered to your doorstep. And with this link, you save 30% off your entire first grocery order plus a free $50 gift. So I've also created my fasting bundle, which is things that I recommend people get for breaking their fast and also for sustaining their eating period with the right kind of foods. So that link is in the top line of the description right below this video. I definitely recommend you check them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, but they have been for like five or six years now. And it is definitely where you want to be going as pretty much your one-stop shop almost entirely your one-stop shop for what you can get delivered to your doorstep for your intermittent fasting routine. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you think of, and even though it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's still enough to be statistically significant. If someone potentially drops 1% body fat and they do so at 19 years of age and mm -hmm. they carry that one or 2% less body fat throughout their life, yes. you know, that people don't realize the impact that lever has, right? Yeah. Like, so from just a health perspective of uh, these, you know, adipokines and all these things are yes. secreted by the yep. fat as well. That's an excellent analogy. And in mice, to look at the mechanisms, uh, there's many things in the mitochondria, thermogenesis and energy expenditure. But we think the driving force potentially with that small reduction in fat is the increase in muscle mass. So the theory is if you have more of a metabolic rate from an increase in muscle with exercise, maybe that's gonna stimulate more thermogenesis or energy expenditure and have some more of a direct effect on body fat loss. And I totally agree with you. If you're carrying around even one or two percentages later on in life, that could accumulate. I think the big message is the creatine and resistance training did not increase body fat and that has huge implications from a longevity perspective. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of potential mechanisms I can think of. Mm -hmm. I mean, one side is obviously the muscle mass side, of mm -hmm. course, and your resting energy expenditure. But right. the other side is just 
absolute strength mm -hmm. and absolute energy output. Yes. You know, it's yep. like I tend to look at things at an RPE scale. Yeah. Like uh, as an athlete, mm -hmm. I try to I try to not look at my metrics too much because they'll mess with my head. I try mm -hmm. to base things on a uh, rating of perceived exertion. Right. And I guess my point with that is like if I'm training consistently at an eight and then I start taking creatine mm -hmm. and I'm still consistently training at an eight, mm -hmm. my absolute output has increased at that said eight. So my actual ability to train my ha has, has increased even though my demand on my body is the same. In other words, I'm probably burning more calories. That's right. I'm, that's, you know, so you don't even realize it because you're still right. an eight. Yep, that's 100% correct. And some of the adjuncts to having an increase in training volume with uh, creatine is some of those effects as well, yeah. And especially in even a, in a non-athlete mm -hmm. where they're just they're just training just to stay healthy right and they don't even realize that their volume has increased mm -hmm. you know if someone like myself or someone that uh, you know like andy galpin working with, you know mm -hmm. you're looking at these things like i go to the gym and be like oh shoot you know i only did you know 16 sets today instead of 20 like my volume's down right. uh i will notice that and i will dwell on that but someone that is maybe just getting started mm -hmm. they don't realize that hey they squeezed out an extra three reps or right. they were able to withstand a couple extra you know uh sets altogether yeah. do you think that potentially the sleep improvement mm. could be playing a role? Huge uh, application, great question. Um, in theory, yes, uh, because we all know, you, it doesn't matter what, how much coffee you drink the next day, if you're sleep deprived, it's gonna affect you all day and your training will basically be substantially decreased. And if cr sleep deprivation can be overcome, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest creatine will make you sleep better, but there's good evidence to suggest that it can offset the negative effects of sleep deprivation. So that's one way to look at it at, on the nights you're, you're cramming or just didn't sleep well. Um, maybe creatine can help aid your ability to have focus and that could have implications in the fourth quarter of basketball or, or uh, soccer, football. And then in the gym, you know, when you're really trying to focus on that last um, set where you're fatigued and you know you want to have a goal to train for an athlete especially training for the Olympics coming up um, it has huge implications over time so I agree that to the athlete getting one or two more repetitions could mean the, the difference between a gold and a silver medal or a world, world championship to the average person it might allow them to stimulate their metabolic rate more often and progress in the gym and if you have positive reinforcement from the, the laws of psychology the more positive reinforcement you have there's a greater chance you're going to keep doing it so if creatine can give any hope or benefit to an individual starting out currently performing exercise or wanting to get back in the gym i see no reason why it can't be considered yeah yeah and even and even mood i mean if someone yes. if someone is if their mood is improved mm -hmm. because they're not sleeping, but their right. mood still improves and they're able to make better conscious decisions yes. with their diet, that's a huge role too, or a huge role too. Yes. And then, you know, I think about that. Uh, is there any data, there may or may not be, on creatine and glycemic control? The only data we have are, is from Brazil and it's primarily in type 2 diabetics where it actually re reduced um, glucose, or sorry, improved glucose disposal into the muscle, but from a glycemic in, in index in the blood, it didn't really have any detrimental or uh, uh, positive effects. Um, it did allow more glucose to get into the muscle cell, and so therefore it reduced your blood glucose levels, and that could have implications for not storing body fat from beta oxidation later on. Yeah, I mean, if you're not inhibiting lipolysis Correct. by having you know that yep. elevation there. Yes. Or, and then once again, just allowing more glycogen to be synthesized so that you can actually Correct. so it's a lot of these indirect things but mm -hmm. it's very interesting and you know for those that aren't familiar with how a study is broken down mm -hmm. or they're not a biostatistician like can you describe what statistically significant versus non-significant is because it's yeah. it, it's used a lot but i know the mainstream doesn't quite understand what that yeah. means and there's a lot of debate over this especially in the last decade so statistically significant is a probability that and we typically use something called 0 0.05 that means uh, five percent of the effect could be by chance but 95 percent is from the treatment so for example if you are reading a research paper and it says p is less than 0 0.05 that means based on probability that we're 95 percent confident that the treatment in this case less for argument's sake creatine versus placebo creatine had a, an effect but if it was 0 0.06 we yeah. say it's not significant but then the practical individuals say just because it's not mathematically uh, uh, significant doesn't mean it's not practically significant so there's the big disconnect where in research papers 
Um, we have to set out before we start to study what our level of significant is. And we need to do that. Imagine if we were uh, testing a drug for cancer and we just said, no, it worked and it didn't, that would have catastrophic effects. So just because something is significant in, in a lab may not mean practicality to uh, on the field and vice versa, but it's all based on mathematical uh, chance, basically, or, or probability. The lower the number, so 0 0.0001, we're really confident that it had a high treatment effect. And then it gets into things called effect sizes and, and things like that as well. So the lower the number, less than 0 0.05, the greater the probability or greater the effect it has, the higher the amount uh, probably has no effect or no significant effect. Yeah, so when you see this with pretty large cohorts, mm -hmm. and you look at this data, it's pretty promising. That's correct. So the larger the population in a research study, that means you have chance of greater statistical power. Uh, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of studies in sport nutrition and sports medicine have low sample sizes because it requires a lot of people to volunteer their time. And, and sometimes having 10 or 15 per group, uh, you may find some beneficial effects, but it may not have been adequately powered. And, and the latest study we did with postmenopausal women, we had well over 80% statistical power, which seems to be the gold standard uh, for, or for confidence. And we had over 200 individuals there. So it's very difficult in humans. In rodent models, it's a lot easier. Uh, and it also depends on the type of study you're doing, but um, statistical power is usually based on the sample size uh, that you have. It'd be great if we could take eight and a half billion people in the world, randomize them into two groups and, and test the effect, but it's not going to happen. So yeah. it's some of the limitations with experimental research. Yeah. So if we come back to fat loss and even fat metabolism, mm -hmm. Is there anything suggesting that creatine might play a role in fatty acid oxidation or is, uh, is that completely, I mean, obviously it's a different energy pathway altogether, but is there anything leading to that at all? In mice, there's some evidence that it will increase hormone sensitive lipase, which is the big enzyme for lipolysis. So once you break down a triglyceride or your stored body fat, the fatty acids primarily go to an area called the mitochondria, which will burn body fat. And then there's another small component called glycerol. And we think that will go to your liver to produce glucose. So people on a high ketogenic diet or basically consuming protein and fat can live a long, healthy life because they're making glucose internally. But there is evidence that when the triglyceride molecule is basically uh, broken down, the fatty acids will gain entry into the mitochondria. And as we all know, the mitochondria is the only organelle that burns body fat. That's why I'm a huge proponent of cardiovascular exercise. Cardiovascular exercise will cause those mitochondria not only to replicate, but get bigger. So if you want to live longer, free of disease, resistance training, but please consider cardio exercise because that's the organelle that will burn body fat. And if you have the two, then you get a synergistic effect. Yeah. And then lastly, what is a, a dosing strategy for people that are worried, or I shouldn't say worried, but concerned mm -hmm. with fat loss? Like what is, what if that's their goal, they say, okay, I'm, I'm going to the gym three days a week. I'm not right. an animal. I'm yeah. just, just trying to get healthy. And I really just want to, you know, live a healthier mm -hmm. life and maybe shed some body fat along with my diet. Right. What would you, what would you suggest for as far as a dosing strategy? Yeah. The cool thing is it sort of uh, or, uh, mimics the, the muscle uh, dosage and uh, anywhere between three to five grams a day will cause that muscle potential beneficial effect, which will parallel into the fat burning effect as well. There is not a dose that is recommended for pure fat burning because we think it's an indirect effect. So I think if you're taking three to five grams a day for every day uh, uh, for many months or whichever, you'll probably notice an improvement somehow from either an increase in muscle mass, decrease in body uh, uh, mass, or a combination of both. So Dr. Kando, where can everyone find you, man? Uh, the best is probably at Instagram at Dr. Darren Kando. Perfect. As always, see you tomorrow.